Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Steve Jewell. I'm with uh, Community Giving and we're glad that you could join us today for another in our series called Community Connections. And so uh, welcome. We'll give people just a quick opportunity to uh, join and wait for people to get into the room here. But thank you so much for joining us today. And we're glad to have you with us on a beautiful Tuesday um, in May. Hopefully some of you are maybe enjoying watching this while you're, while you're outdoors. So we'll give people just a couple more seconds here to get into the room and then we'll get started. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you once again for uh, for joining us and spending part of your day with us with our Community Connections webinar series. Um, today, we're very excited to present um, uh, the Social Capital Survey results. Um, and uh, our team of executive directors are gonna talk about um, the results led by Carol Turnow at the Central Minnesota Community Foundation and uh, just talk about what it, what it means to understand and know about uh, this thing called social capital. So I'd like to remind everybody that if they do have questions and answers or questions they'd like answered, um, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll do our best to answer them as we go. Um, and there will be time towards the end also to have um, additional uh, discussion. And we really appreciate the questions because you know, what we want today especially to be is just a conversation conversation about social capital and what it means to our, our communities and, and how, um, how it is evolved and how it continues to develop and grow and what lessons can we learn from it. So, um, so please do feel free to uh, have your questions uh, put into, uh, please put your questions into the Q&A um, and we'll definitely uh, want to talk about them. Um, just a very brief note about these uh, webinars, all of them are recorded. And so in the past we've done, uh, before COVID, we hadn't done one webinar and, and now I think we may have done um, 30 or 40 of them. And really it was our attempt to try to stay connected with folks uh, during the pandemic. And as we come out of the pandemic, we're not certain exactly, but we still um, appreciate the opportunity to connect this way. And hopefully you do as well. And especially as we talk about important issues to our communities, we think it is important to come together and, and talk. So um, stay tuned for um, uh, what we'll be thinking about for um, providing webinars going forward. And as always, we appreciate your ideas and thoughts and you can email us at info at communitygiving.org. So now on to uh, talk about social capital. And actually um, the team had asked me to provide a backdrop uh, and, and talk a little bit about this thing called social capital. So. I'm gonna kick things off with just a brief conversation about social capital itself and, and, and why. why, why do we talk about it? Um, so, and this actually goes back a number of years, back to um, uh, the late 1990s. And um, I was a fairly new executive director or uh, president at the Central Minnesota Community Foundation. We had a fantastic uh, program officer on staff by the name of Susan Lorenz. And uh, we were uh, looking at um, our charge uh, to try to you know, make a difference in this community. And our board was very interested in talking about how do we build community. And um, it happened to be that uh, um, Susan and I both attended a national conference for community foundations. And it was at this conference that we first heard Dr. Robert Putnam um, from Harvard University talk about this concept called social capital. And uh, he basically described it this way. He said that, you know, um, social capital is, um, is, is that very simple, somewhat intangible thing that connects people to one another. And he had just written a book called Bowling Alone. And if you recall, some of you who are old enough remember what was going on in the 1990s. Um, you know, he was in his book talking about how more lanes of bowling um, had happened uh, at that time than in any other time in history, but that bowling leagues had taken a dive and that they had actually declined rapidly. And so what was happening is that, you know, during the whole um, 20th century from 1900 to year 2000, at the beginning, there were a lot of people joining and, and being a part of various groups, but then somewhere around 1960 or 1970, 
membership and participation in these um, civic groups and, and social organizations dropped off dramatically. And his belief at the time was that people were choosing to do things um, not in groups, but preferring to do things alone. And the same is true about bowling. Instead of with you know uh, bowling leagues um, not necessarily growing, but the number of lanes being bowled actually growing was showing us that people preferred to bowl alone. And his theory basically was that these social connections and these interactions between people actually have value and that they build trust, they build relationships. And when you have those trusts, that trust, and you have those relationships, that actually that leads to positive outcomes in many indicators of the quality of life that we experience. Um, in some areas of um, educational outcomes um, are actually higher when, when you have higher levels of social capital, you have safer streets, you have stronger economic growth, oftentimes even more effective government. These are all statistics that he and his researchers had looked at and had, had written books on. And, um, and he was speaking at our national conference about this concept. And he said uh, that there had been um, a pilot project with about 20 community foundations around the United States because they'd come up with a way to actually measure the level of social capital in a local community. Well, Susan and I both said, you know, this would be fantastic if we could do something like this in the greater St. Cloud area, mainly to help benchmark and provide a metric to look at where is this level of trust in our community and where are we experiencing um, challenges or opportunities to, in essence, grow that if it really leads to the outcome we desire. And uh, we weren't able to participate in the first pilot group um, but we were able to uh, participate in a, in a different way, um, basically with the same survey. And we went forward in a partnership with the St. Cloud Times and we hired upfront consulting and we did the very first social capital survey. And we found out some interesting things and that, um, and, and some of it people would say, well, that was obvious, but in Minnesota that in particular were high levels of social capital. And, um, and we felt it was important not just to have a metric, probably more important um, was that we wanted to start the conversations about this thing called social capital and get people thinking, what does it really mean um, to build relationships and in, in general, build trust and build community? Because that's what it's really all about. It's in our name as a community foundation, but what does it mean for how do we build community? And one of the things we learned early on, and Dr. Putnam talks about, in his book is that there's really two types of social capital. He talks about bonding social capital, which is nice and it's great. Um, and it's really kind of two people who come from a similar background, uh, discovering that another person has that kind of same background and they, they bond. And we kind of joke that it in one respect may, meant maybe two Scandinavian Luther Norwegians got together and enjoyed Ludafisk because that's what they liked. Um, and that, that and, and Putnam said, you know, bonding social capital is wonderful. It has great value. Um, but he said there's another type of social capital, which is actually more challenging, more difficult to build, and actually probably even produces greater value to a community than that social capital. And, you know, it, it's really taking two individuals who maybe don't come from the same background, don't share a lot in common, but they find a way to connect and come together. And, um, and learn from one another. And it's this bridging social capital that really has the potential to um, help build community because the divisions that exist often can sometimes even feel like walls. And so how do you find those areas of uh, something in common when, when, when you might not have the same roots or origins? And so I know as we've watched St. Cloud change um, and I can remember, you know, for example, um, the first time I had an opportunity and I was invited to an iftar dinner, which is the breaking of the fast of, in, in, in Ramadan. And um, I can remember my friend Toho, who now actually is a board member of the Central Minnesota Community Foundation, the first time he invited me. And I'll be honest, I was a little bit uncertain. I didn't know what to expect, but what a wonderful experience. What an incredible opportunity. They had a number of us who weren't Muslim um, join them. And, um, and they explained things to us and uh, they provided kind of someone to help us know and understand what was going on. And afterwards we shared a meal together. And what a wonderful, incredible opportunity and experience. 
uh, in my opinion, to um, build bridging social capital. And so um, the Community Foundation, Central Minnesota Community Foundation, um, continued to measure this level of social capital every five years, going back now 20 years. And um, the essential thing about this, again, is that um, relationships matter, that building trust, and in particular, building trust and building bridges where social capital might be strained or doesn't exist is, is really important. And so um, we think that, again, it's an important topic to, to measure, but even probably more important to just talk about, to discuss, to learn from it and say, what does it mean? And I want to fast forward and just tell you one last example of it. And that is in the last social capital survey, um, some of the funding following that survey was focused on how do we encourage building bridges in the greater St. Cloud area? And Susan Lorenz, when she was here as a program staff member, um, had uh, worked with Dan Wilderson at St. Cloud State University who, run the, who ran the Holocaust Center. He had a wonderful student, um, graduate student who was working with him by the name of Walid Issa. Walid had, uh, was Palestinian, had grown up on, um, uh, on the West Bank and he was here in the United States and, and had a, so much to offer uh, about understanding differences between people and challenges that communities face. And they created a program which we helped fund. And one of the things they did was they brought together various cultural groups in St. Cloud, um, including chief of police person, um, other community leaders, as well as just general ordinary citizens from different backgrounds. And one of the things they did was travel to um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And they toured that museum. And afterwards, they spent a lot of time dialoguing and talking about the importance of building bridges. Because if you think about the, the worst case scenario of when hate builds up in our communities, it really probably is genocide. It's where we feel so strongly about our own beliefs that we don't consider someone else's beliefs. And that project, um, from what we heard from those people who participated, really helped provide a grounding and a basis in helping them understand another person's point of view. And where we exist today in our society and, and the challenges we face, you know, um, so many different places, we feel it's important as community foundations that building bridges is a part of who we are. It's about how do we bring uh, red and blue together to make purple? How do we understand the issues such as diversity, equity, inclusion, and can talk about them, learn about them, and implement things so that we can move forward in a positive way and, and build bridges so that we are all better because we understand and we're building this level of social capital in our communities. So that's a little bit of the background and the reason why we talk about social capital, why we're believers in it, and why a survey is actually done. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Carol and the other executive directors to share with you the results, as well as some of the great things that are happening in some of the other communities um, around this topic of social capital. Carol? Thanks so much, Steve. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, uh, we just completed our social capital survey uh, for 2020. Our first one was in 2004. We would not be able to do the survey without the help of our partners. And so I've listed them here. Um, they've all, they all contribute um, finances to help us with this. And that they have an invested interest in um, our community being a strong community. So these partnerships are just one more example of social capital. The St. Cloud State University is the one who conducted this study for us today. And what I'm giving you is preliminary information. So um, we don't have the final report that will tell us um, the exact number for social capital so that we can compare it to prior years. But I will show you some comparisons of specific topics um, over the time periods as well. It's been an interesting um, effort this time because we actually started working on this survey um, and had planned to start it February of 2020. And the reason that we picked that time slot was we knew it was an election year. We wanted to make sure that um, it wouldn't be, uh, the survey wouldn't be done at the same time that people were getting a lot of political uh, phone calls and surveys too. Um, unfortunately, uh, COVID 
hit in uh, 2020 and there was social distancing and distance learning. We actually, uh, St. Cloud State actually was able to conduct, start conducting the survey in September and October of this year. Um, and even though um, respondents were asked to answer according to prior to COVID, after being um, thrown into this for six, seven months already, it's pretty hard to, to filter that out. So you will see some declines that we really do think are uh, indicative of the fact that we've been through a pandemic, um, the political tensions that have gone on um, and our local and national unrest under racial inequities in our justice system. So just a little bit more background on social capital. It was named by social scientist, James Coleman, and it is about mutually respectful relationships, connectedness, trustworthiness. So we're gonna concentrate on, on trust and um, some networking opportunities and share that information as well. Um, so uh, Katie, you wanna go to the next slide and we'll get to our first topic. So the first thing that we asked people is, um, would you say that generally people can be trusted or you can't be too careful? So um, interestingly enough, there was a significant decrease in trust from 2015 to today and likely due to the many factors that I indicated before. When we look at um, where we were in 2015, it was quite an increase from 2010 too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to see the pattern and the swing. And even more interestingly, if you go back and look at what was going on in the communities at those times, it, you know, it tells a whole different story. So um, looking at our numbers this time, and we can look forward and see, um, we can go ahead, thank you, Katie, um, that we looked at the different demographics then of what comprised this general um, trust theory. And you can see in our first screen there that white people's viewpoint and people of colors was very different. 70% of uh, white people felt that um, you could pretty much generally trust everyone. Um, where people of color really felt that uh, you can't be too careful. And also in age groups, when we looked at how people answered according to their ages, you can see that 18 to 24 year olds were less trusting. And it seems to appear that as we grow older, we become more trusting then. I think some of that could be the fact that as we live richer and fuller lives, you know, and get exposed to more things, our trust level probably increases then. So I'm gonna move on to the next screen then, Katie. Our next question was really about um, trust in our local institutions. And so when we talk about local institutions, we're talking about your neighbors, um, the police and local stores. How did people feel that we fared? And for the most part, um, people felt that they trusted these organizations or these institutions a lot or some. So um, that's very positive. And you can see that police is one of the highest categories for 2021. We think that there's a couple of reasons for that, even though there's been a lot of um, national and statewide um, concerns over uh, justice. We do have a very positive police alliance with community leaders and police coming together and developing this alliance. And it's been in place for a number of years. We also have the cop house um, that was, um, I believe it's two to three years old now. That is another way for police to develop positive relationships with community residents as well. I think that's very indicative. Now, what's interesting is that it, if you look at the 20 to 21, it looks like, wow, we have a lot of trust in what we do locally. But if you look at the history of where we were in 2015, where we were at our highest, you can see that we have fallen quite a ways from before. And never before have we been in the 80%. We were always in the mid 90s in our trust level of local institutions. Okay, the next screen. Kate, great. Now here we're talking about our government then. And you can see that our trust in national government is um, very low. It actually 26% of people trust the national government 
um, most or all of the time with 48% trusting our local government. Um, and that local government number has been pretty consistent throughout all of our studies then. So I think some of that has to do that when we're talking about our local government, we actually know those individuals as, as people, not just as institutions or parties as well. So that helps. Next, we looked at trust um, according to um, race and ethnicity. And we asked very specific questions um, about how, they, how people felt about their own race as well as um, other races or ethnicities. And 94% um, of people trust people of other ethnicities and their own a lot or some. The only decline that we can see on the right hand side is that there was a slight decrease in the trust of white people then. And one of the most significant changes that you can see here is that in 2010, we started tracking the Somali um, people, new to our um, community, fairly new at that time, and they were at 56%. That has grown in 2020 to 84%. And I think again, um, when uh, Steve was talking about FTAR and the, the opportunity to, to be involved and to learn about people's cultures and to get to know people as individuals, it helps to build that trust and build relationships as well. Okay, next uh, one, this is a new area for us. We've never tracked these before. But um, people are typically happier and healthier when social capital is high. And so we wanted to check in and see where are we at as far as um, physical health, mental health, and happiness then. So what we found is that 55% of all respond respondents indicated that they have excellent or very good health with 15% having fair or poor health. Now, what I'm showing you here is a screen that shows uh, white people versus people of color. And there are some changes there, but the numbers I'm giving you are for overall. Um, as for happiness, 92% said that they were happy or very happy. Um, now, people of color stated that they were not very happy or not happy at all three times more frequently than white respondents. And again, I think that's very indicative of the events that have unfolded this past year. Next, we're gonna look at mental health. And overall, respondents felt that their mental health was excellent or good, with only 18% saying that it was fair or poor. People of color chose poor 200% times more often than white people did. You can see that men were more likely to state that their mental health was excellent, where women reported fair to poor more often than men did as well. Next, we're going to look at um, our community participation. So the categories are working on a community project, attend a public meeting, attend a political meeting or rally, attend one any, any club or organizational meeting. So obviously we would expect that our numbers are down this year because with social distancing, most of these things didn't occur. The one thing that did show an increase was attending a political meeting or rally. And of course that makes total sense considering this was a presidential election year. So what was interesting about the politics is that we had 20% uh, of people say that they were not interested at all in politics then. At the same time, we had 90% of the respondents state that they had registered to vote. And I believe that I had heard that this is the, the year uh, nationally, the highest number ever of people voting in elections. So great. Um, and then we had volunteerism. You can see here that volunteerism has dropped. And again, we would expect that that, is, that would be true considering the type of year that we've had most recently. So I think the one disappointment about this study is the fact that we would not be able to um, really tell the five-year history of what's happening because this, this really is a, a snapshot in time at the moment. Um, you can see because we weren't having um, a lot of volunteer opportunities, 
people did take the opportunity to be on a specific committee and do a specific task or committee uh, officer. And so those things increased. A couple of other things that we found interesting is there was a decline in philanthropic dollars and there was also um, a decrease in attendance of religious services. And particularly those, the number who um, do not attend any religious service at all had risen significantly. So um, let's see, next, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, again, the fact that social capital is um, something that makes our lives healthier, safer, and, and richer. And we, it makes us better able to govern or adjust in stable democracy. I think that's really important. With seeing that our numbers are significantly lower in um, St. Cloud now, we will be looking at what are some things that we can do in our communities to improve or build on our social capital. And I think that's really important considering that there has been a lot of polarization. Um, there's a lot more um, social media. People are, are kind of uh, going within rather than getting out and meeting and talking with people in uh, standard ways. And there's a, there's a difference in the way that we communicate in social media. It makes us a little bit braver to say things that maybe we, we would never say to people face to face. And that can be damning or hurting. So um, I wanted to have our, ask our other EDs if they could come on. And we wanted to talk about some of the positive things that are already going on in our communities that makes a difference. And um, also I would invite you to share in the chat, what are some things that you see that are being done or that can be done to build social capital? And when we say build social capital, it's about making, building relationships, helping people to get to know other people as well. So, um, Sarah, would you want to start with some of the things that are going on in Wilmer? Sure. Thanks, Carol. So we have um, really been espousing the idea of social capital as well um, as a sister foundation to the Central Minnesota Community Foundation Group. And um, some examples over the last few years that we've really found are impactful are the kinds of things that get people shoulder to shoulder. They, they're pitching in on a project that they can see a common end to, or they're sitting uh, side by side at a table and, and getting to know one another over a community meal. So some specific examples in Wilmer are within the last few years, we've built a significant playground mm -hmm. in one of our community parks. That was a community design, community build playground um, and that had 3,792 volunteers involved uh, during the course of that project. And I will tell you, I'm very grateful that we did that project going into a pandemic. It was completed before the pandemic, but that social capital um, has been a tide in our community that has kept, kept going and it's gotten other people engaged um, because they loved that feeling and they loved the, the sense that when they go out onto the park, that's something we did together. So another great example at the start of the pandemic was we uh, realized soon into the pandemic that there was going to be a, what we called the gap week where children in our school districts were not going to be fed during that two week time frame um, that the governor uh, rescinded schools and pushed the staff to start developing their hybrid and online learning curricula. And in Wilmer, we have a significant number of children who qualify for free and reduced lunch. So for them, that was gonna be incredibly destabilizing. And so in four days, we reached out to that whole group of volunteers that we had used in the playground. And we created a gap week feeding project where we served 10,752 meals um, on very short notice. Um, it was very fun to see buses and volunteers using some distancing, we weren't into masks yet in, in that point in time, but using some distancing, but so eager to do something that would be helpful um, in the face of all of the uncertainty. Um, and we certainly have other examples where we have community leadership teams, nonprofit teams that get together on a regular basis started during the pandemic that will continue now. Um, and also our, like our women's fund, 
that has been really focused for four years on, um, on exploitation and human trafficking and how they've created a coalition of, of folks uh, who all share their concerns around this issue and are willing to dig in and, and do some serious work. So social capital is the lifeblood of what we do when we get into the programmatic arena. You also uh, have a program called um, Vision 2040, right? And that's it. We do. And that is, um, for those that are familiar with the St. Cloud model and the community pillars, our version of Vision 2040 is a grassroots community leadership development and strategic planning effort. And so it has really tackled issues like um, how do we connect our diverse populations together so that they too can be part of planning. Um, we just recently released an anti-racism statement, which has been um, something interesting to navigate, but we're trying very hard to uh, use that goodwill built in the community to connect people and have those thought provoking conversations about what do we want our community to be and who are our new neighbors in reality. So I think that that's been um, powerful. And those all of that information, you can go to Wilmer Lakes Area Vision 2040.com if you want to know about that and see our anti-racism statement. Or if you go to the Wilmer Area Women's Fund off of our community giving site, you'll see some of that. And I'd be happy to share um, via our Facebook page at the Wilmer Area Community Foundation for photos of Gap Week and the Playground Project. Great. Before we go on to Carl and Holly, I just want to say that if anybody has any questions for us, you can use the question or chat feature to um, ask those. And um, the webinars that we're doing today are, are webinars that we've been doing since the pandemic struck. And it's, again, another way for us to share information. We started out wanting to be a support for nonprofits. Uh, we wanted to maintain our connections with professional advisors. And then we saw an opportunity to provide a safe place for people to learn about race issues as well. So um, we, it, it's so important for us to have a place where we can talk and trust that what we say um, is safe to be said. So um, Carl, I'm gonna go to you next and if you can share some examples in Brainerd. Great, um, thank you, Carol and Sarah for your comments and for the work you're doing in this area. Uh, of course, Brainerd is a much more uh, homogeneous or less diverse community than, uh, than either St. Cloud area or Wilmer area would be. Um, and I'm sure Holly's gonna say the same thing about Alexandria. So things tend to look a little bit differently here. Um, one of the projects that we've been supporting since uh, basically five years ago when I came on is we reinvigorated the newcomers club here in our community. So. Uh, one of the bridging efforts we need to do better in the Brainerd Lakes area is welcoming new people to our community, uh, whether they are uh, people of color or not. Uh, I think we can always have, or I'll just say Brainerd can do a better job of, of that, of welcoming people in. Uh, so we got the Newcomers Club going again uh, in 2017 and have been supporting it every year since then. Uh, initiative foundations come alongside, I know at least once on a grant for them as well. And uh, what we do there is uh, people who are in our community less than three years are invited to take part uh, in social activities. Of course, it's been pretty quiet uh, over the last year with COVID, but uh, we basically built it up from just a handful of people when we started up to now about 200 on the mailing list or are part of that group and they regular, when they have events, uh, they're regularly in that 40, 30, 40 range of folks coming together. Uh, we also have formed a welcoming communities group uh, in our community that uh, is trying to make um, our community more welcoming for people of color. And one of the activities we did was come alongside our chamber in region five and uh, supported an, an initiative to create more inclusive workplaces. So uh, we had the DEED uh, regional analyst with us and, and they have an inclusive workplace program called IWE and uh, in, inclusive workplace employers. So it's a certification program for employers uh, to help uh, become more inclusive, not just more diverse, but more inclusive. 
And so we held a workshop. We had about 130 people, mostly from the business community, um, taking part in that effort. And we're also um, encouraging, we're trying to be much more um, intentional about inviting people of color to our newcomers club as a way to connect them and help build those bridges in our community. So I'd say that's uh, kind of our primary act, uh, activity right now around uh, building social capital in our community. And I'll turn it over to Holly up in Alexandria. Thanks, Carl. All right, thanks, Carl. So Alexandria is the smallest of the foundations that are uh, partnering with community giving. So we're really in a little different situation. Um, we're in the process of really trying to grow our assets and. I'm only the second staff the foundation has even had. And so um, I started about a year and a half ago and I've been spending a lot of my time actually trying to build my own personal capital, social capital in the community. So people know who I am as a representative of the community foundation. Um, so one way though, I think that we probably had and in one area the most impact um, around social capital is with our nonprofits. So, Actually, prior to starting with the foundation, I had started a nonprofit executive director networking group. And it was perfect because I took this job and now I'm a, a member of it. So uh, we convene monthly and uh, it's been a great way to really build trust, um, more um, just connections within the nonprofit sector. Uh, during COVID, I would say that that nonprofit group really we were uh, helped each other get through COVID. We were meeting uh, weekly for a while just to help us with our own mental health, just uh, to, to stay connected, be connected, and of course everything via Zoom. So that group has really built a lot of trust, has found ways to partner you know, with each other. They're just natural uh, because people are building relationship and finding ways to align. Uh, doing projects together, finding ways to partner with each other. And so that is one area where I feel like we have, have really made a difference uh, in, in our community is with the nonprofit sector and, and really building social capital and creating a probably a, I, I wanna say a healthier sector uh, because of it. Uh, now we even, we do trainings, uh, we bring information to each other uh, to share uh, so that we can really build our own capacity um, in our own organizations. So a lot of good things have happened through that group. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll just turn it back to you, Carol. Um, Thank you so much, Holly, um, all of you for, for what's happening in your communities. Um, I, I know that during the pandemic too, we all had an opportunity um, at our community foundations to have response funds. So uh, even though uh, the uh, indicator on our social capital report said that philanthropic dollars were down, it, that's not what we experienced um, at the foundation. We were very fortunate to have um, donors give to our response fund so that we could turn around and help our nonprofits in our communities to uh, sustain the good work that they were doing. And they were under a lot of demand this year. Um, so that was, it was very heartwarming to see that as well. I know that also um, some of our businesses uh, were, had a difficult time and um, there were programs that were established in some of our communities that helped to support them during this. Um, and even, you know, those things that we do individually, you know, I think um, often about how fortunate I am to, in my own little neighborhood here um, that, through the pandemic, you know, I could go outside and stand in my driveway and talk to my neighbors. And, you know, we already had a relationship and, and we, we care about each other. We watch out for each other. And that's so important in a time when you feel like you possibly couldn't have gone out and, and saw family as frequently as, as you would have liked to, or you had to do it by screen. So just that human contact can be so important to us. So, um, I think that, you know, when we are looking at a time when um, the social distancing hopefully is going to soon be in our rear view mirror, or we'll have more flexibility, you know, we want to uh, take advantage of those opportunities to be able to, to reach out and connect and, and be curious about um, other people that we haven't met yet, um, share our interests with other people. 
Uh, I um, also, yeah, was going to mention that, um, Holly, you have a, a group that is working um, on it that you call the Community Conversations, right? Um, right. And mm -hmm. maybe you can tell a little bit about that before we finish up. Sure. Well, this is an initiative, you know, I can't even remember how I met Joni Nilsson through some connection, <laughs> but uh, she started, and it all came, you know, after through COVID, but um, in response to, you know, just our whole inclusion, diversity, equity, uh, all around that, uh, conversations that matter is what the group is called. And it, it really happened organically where she uh, just talked to different organizations of businesses about bringing in people to talk about what it's like to be a person of color in your community. And so um, it's, it's been growing. I know our board went through it too. And, and Joni just brings in a panel of people who just talk about what it's like to live in our communities um, when you're of a different culture and race. And it's not easy, it's difficult. And then we discuss it and talk about you know, what we've learned um, on how those stories resonate and how we can be better about being a welcoming community and how we can you know, really um, reach out to people and make them feel um, valued and, and a part of a community. So it's, uh, we've been a part of it just through our board and, uh, and tried to help promote that in the community as well. So it's a, it's a good program. So thank you for asking. I think Joni, if anyone's been on any of these webinars, Joni actually did a webinar, uh, I don't know, a month ago or so, if anyone had the opportunity. If anyone's interested in getting your contact information, I'd be happy to share it. Um, I don't think it's just for Alexandria if other communities would like to do something as well. That's great. And we do have a copy of that um, video on our website as well for people to be able to look at. Um, just one more thing I wanted to mention, and, and I don't want to make this um, a concentration of, of race because it's so much more than that. But one of the projects that uh, Central Minnesota Community Foundation is doing is a equity um, community assessment. And so we've asked um, organizations, what are you doing around racial equity? Because it is a, a topic right now that, that so many of us care about. And so this is located on our website and you can see what organizations are doing um, in different categories. And the thing that we really like about it is that it gives an opportunity for people who care about a specific topic to find out what nonprofits are working on those things and possibly become involved with it. Uh, nonprofits can collaborate on projects and it's just a, another way for us to help to build those connections then. And then Carl, I'm gonna turn it over for you for closing, but before you do close, just a little bit, um, if you'd share about the census and the work that um, your community foundation did to help, to help with that as well. Well, sure, we just signed on to be part of the uh, complete count committee in our county and growing county. So he's active in that. And then um, we also served on the uh, public policy committee of Minnesota Council on Foundations. Uh, but we were really active in um, trying to encourage people to complete their census survey. So, uh, and when you keep your eighth congressional seat and 10th electoral college vote uh, by 89, if 89 more people in New York would have been counted or 26 less people in Minnesota, uh, wouldn't have been count or yeah wouldn't have been counted we would have lost our seat so so we're taking credit <laughs> um, you know but it's just a way that we can get involved as community foundation folks and, and uh, encourage people to be civically engaged I did want to add to just from my previous work when I was down at the initiative foundation um, a long time ago but uh, we we actually uh, were quite involved in in uh, social capital projects but we are aware of that initial study that Northwest Area Foundation completed after Putnam's book came out, Bowling Alone, that Steve mentioned. And they studied the 26 communities they are working with around the country uh, on their anti-poverty programs. And to, to understand the importance of social capital, um, when they studied those communities, the one community that had the, uh, that were happiest with where they lived, the people responding, uh, had the lowest economic per capita income, but they had the highest social capital uh, rating for their community. Um, so, you know, it's really an important factor for us as we consider the happiness. 
how well do we uh, know our neighbors? How much do we trust them? Uh, that we can count on some, somebody if something goes wrong. You know, so it is a really critical um, factor in our communities for, for being happy about where we live. So uh, we just encourage you to reach out, build those bridges um, with others. Uh, we all have a role to play in this too, uh, to build that social capital. So we encourage you to all play a part in that. So I am. Uh, I do not see any questions in the Q and A or in the chat. So um, just to let you know that if you want to find any more information out about social capital, what we're doing, our funding programs, et cetera, uh, you can contact any of the four of us that work at the partner foundations. Uh, you've seen us all here today. There's our contact information. Um, we also have a, a bevy of resources on our website. So if we want to go to that. Uh, you can see, you can find uh, all of our past Community Connections webinars at communitygiving.org, Community Connections. I encourage you to watch um, the one that Holly mentioned about the uh, uh, conversations that matter. It was really powerful, especially the video they produced about that event. Um, another one that's really interesting was shortly after the killing of George Floyd, we brought on a uh, policeman from, uh, I wanna say Columbia Heights, uh, down in the Northern suburbs area. Um, with a black man who was uh, a health inspector and uh, the bridge building that occurred between them was really a great session too. So if you have a chance to watch that, uh, that would be really good. Um, some of our foundations are still doing uh, COVID response grants and uh, you can find applications for that at that COVID-19 site. Um, at Brainerd, I know we've expended all of our resources or our response fund grant. So uh, we're not doing any more of those right now. Uh, if you have input on either today's topic or wanna to provide additional information on what you'd like to hear more about, uh, you can comment at the Idea Center. Um, you can also provide information to us at the info at communitygiving.org. Finally, we have a, a major conference coming up next week. Um, it's uh, gonna be all online. It's over a four day period. Uh, 17th through the 20th. We actually have Robert Putnam as our closing keynote presenter on Thursday, uh, the 20th. So uh, if you want to see him, and uh, we have some other great speakers as well, including the director of uh, Caring Bridge, Neil Kaskari from uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank. He was just on uh, national TV over the weekend. Uh, and then a whole variety of topics around board development, asset development, and community impact. So um, go ahead and check it out at the Empower CF21 uh, site, and we'd love to see you there. So thanks for joining us today. Carol, thanks so much for your work and your team on this and, and uh, my peers for, for their great work in their communities. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you at a future event.